Hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day to join um, uh, this session on defining and implementing a medical device cybersecurity program. My name is John Gomez. I'm the chief executive officer for Sensato. We're an organization uh, out of New Jersey. I'll tell you a little bit about our, our organization, but I really don't want this to be a marketing and sales pitch and really get into um, the actual content that you're here to um, hopefully absorb and, and you can apply within your organization. Uh, but just to give you some context, Sensato, uh, my company started back in 2013. We were the first healthcare specific cybersecurity firm. Uh, since then, we've developed our own security operations center for healthcare. Uh, we work uh, very closely with hospitals. We have our own uh, cybersecurity software platform and what's known as a full stack solution. A few other things just to know about us, because I think this sets the stage for the information that I'm going to share with you and kind of gives you, uh, hopefully, um, reason to kind of, I guess, trust what um, we're presenting. First and foremost, uh, we are also what's known as an ISAO. For those of you that are not familiar with that, uh, ISAOs stand for Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. Uh, they were chartered under uh, President Obama as an executive order uh, that still stands to this day. And basically that order said that the Department of US, uh, the US Department of Homeland Security uh, should establish relationships with private sector organizations to help strengthen uh, our ability to defend against cybersecurity attacks. So Sensato is a ISAO. We have servers in our facilities that trade threat intelligence with the uh, Department of Homeland Security, and uh, we have some other things we do in that vein, but it gives us some insights into what's happening with medical device security. The other thing is um, we have a memorandum of understanding <clears throat> with the FDA. Um, we work with them closely um, on occasion um, to help evaluate threats uh, against medical devices here in the United States. Um, so again, this kind of helps us have a little bit of insight into um, what, you know, what is real, what should be done to help defend against medical device attacks. We started actually working in the medical device space back in 2015 doing risk assessments. And since then there have been uh, numerous accomplishments we've made over time. Um, but all of the information that we've gathered really is kind of the outcome of today's presentation. The information I'm gonna share with you is really based on, on our legacy, our experience, our relationships with DHS and FDA and the work that we do day to day with the hospitals that we work with in terms of protecting uh, their organizations from medical device security attacks. Um, I'm not gonna go too deep into the assessment findings simply because I think most of us at this point in time know that you know, ultimately medical devices, although security for them has improved over the past several years, um, there are still many concerns related to how well uh, a medical device can be defended against a cyber attack. And this threat actually is evolving given the sophistication levels of attackers and their ability to target specific devices um, over time, uh, whether that is a medical device or another device with a computer chip in it. So I think the big takeaway here is that there is real vulnerability when it comes to medical devices. Um, the threats are ongoing. We know of several threats that could impact patient care and patient safety. Um, so really the, 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 the concern, I think, both at a national level uh, and at a sector level, healthcare sector, is um, <clears throat> how, how much time can continue to pass before we see a direct attack against medical devices. So with that, I wanna get a little bit into some things to um, hopefully give you some food for thought. Um, you know, I understand that most of the people attending this are not technical. Uh, so this is not a technical presentation. I'm really looking at this uh, presentation and material I'm presenting to you from the perspective of a um, senior leader within a hospital organization. I'm also trying to temper the fact that resources within any hospital organization um, are limited and there's only so many things you can do. And to that end, I'm going to try to give you some suggestions that hopefully, um, you know, are what we would consider budget friendly, um, especially because of, you know, the, the challenges faced by rural and critical access hospitals in the United States right now. So hopefully with that, um, that preamble, if you will, um, we're set to kind of dive into the meat of this uh, presentation. We, you know, <clears throat> this article in Forbes came out uh, some time ago, and I think it's nothing that we don't know. And, and really, you know, the FDA warning around, you know, that the fact that uh, medical devices are, um, you know, potentially 
unsafe or challenged from a cybersecurity perspective is well known throughout the healthcare sector. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think as you know, sophistication level of attackers have evolved, this has um, become more of a concern day to day for hospital leadership and boards of directors. Um, you know, <clears throat> we saw the first cyber attack attributed uh, to a patient death uh, out of Germany um, quite, uh, you know, about, I guess about eight months ago or so. Now, this wasn't an attack specifically against a medical device, <clears throat> but I bring this up because it's the first attack we know of where uh, law enforcement actually launched a homicide investigation because of a cyber attack. Now, in this specific situation, the attack was actually a ransomware attack. And what happened in this case is the hospital had to divert patients. Uh, unfortunately, for one of the patients, they were diverted to a hospital that was about 30 miles away. So this was kind of a rural hospital in Germany. And um, during that diversion, that transport, uh, unfortunately, the patient died. And so uh, law enforcement in Germany um, you know, equated that to, to a homicide. Uh, and I think this, you know, <clears throat> is something we need to think about that whether an attack is specifically against um, medical devices or is tangential because it's an attack that a hospital experiences that was really aimed at something else in the hospital, such as a ransomware attack, that the loss of patient life is a very real possibility. And one of the other things I think is important to understand in the context of this situation that occurred here in Germany is that you know, we're talking about a situation where a patient had to be diverted to another hospital. And for all of you um, that are attending this conference and, and listening to this presentation, you know, you're kind of in that situation. You may not have, and you probably don't have the luxury of just diverting uh, critical patients uh, or transferring them because there's been an attack on your, your organization. Um, and so I think this creates an even more pressing challenge for rural and critical access hospitals than maybe so for mainstream hospitals, uh, or I shouldn't actually say mainstream, but hospitals in more populated and urban areas, I guess. Um, but I think that this, again, kind of resonates with the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to be a direct attack against medical devices, even though that's what we're trying to figure out how to protect. The other thing I think is important, and I think this will become more of a, um, of a challenge to all hospitals, regardless of size or sector, um, is this article that was written some time ago by uh, FDA. And I think this is a really important thing to, uh, to think about when you're thinking about your medical device strategy. And I think this is the first piece of all of us recognizing that um, medical devices, medical device security is not something that can just be the IT organization or clinical engineering or biomed's responsibility. This is a much bigger conversation that has to happen uh, across the board and across the C-suite and leadership. And that is probably the first piece of advice I would give you is you need to make sure that your medical device security program, your strategy uh, is something that is a boardroom to basement, right? You need to really make sure that everyone in the hospital um, that is involved with patient care understands the challenges and the strategy related to medical device security. And so getting back to this blog article, why this is important and why I bring this up is that in this blog article, one of the things that was raised <clears throat> is if um, patients have a right to know that the medical devices they may be relying on, whether that be for life support or for diagnostics, um, have a susceptibility to uh, cyber attacks, right? And so think of it this way. If you were going in to have an operation or a family member or loved one was going into a hospital and you were going to be relying on a medical device. And even maybe if it's a simple test or, or maybe not such a simple test and that test result could have a dramatic outcome, would you wanna know that those specific devices are susceptible to cyber attack? <clears throat> now, this all raises the question of informed consent. And this is why I kind of bring out the fact that medical device security is not the same as IT security. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments, but it's important to really understand that ultimately from a liability perspective and informed consent perspective, uh, from a strategic perspective and a patient care perspective, 
there's a lot that you need to think about when it comes to medical device security. Uh, and I think this is one of the reasons that as an industry, we really haven't made a lot of progress in terms of how do we deal with this? How do we address it? And things like this blog article, I think really illustrate that this is truly a boardroom to basement kind of challenge and cannot just be relegated to one department or area of the hospital, um, but it really requires, you know, kind of to use an old term, it requires a village to address. So something food for thought. With that, I want to draw your attention to a document that came out back in October of 2018 that was put together by FDA and MITRE, and we actually had some input into this document. And it's really a, a playbook on how to prepare and respond to medical device threats and attacks um, with, from, from a hospital. And there are about five different areas that this playbook covers. It's freely available. You can get it from FDA's website. Um, but it gives you kind of a, a sense of the things you should be thinking about. So if you haven't seen this or, or, or your, your organization or team or colleagues aren't aware of it, it's probably a good document. It's still very relevant today. Uh, if now, if not if more than ever than it has been, it's important for you to familiarize yourself with this. Uh, it's not a very large document, but it also kind of helped us when we started formulating strategies for medical device security. Um, we turn to this document and really think about um, what's in it in terms of setting the foundation, right? The minimally acceptable uh, set of practices, policies, and procedures that should be in place. Now, <clears throat> I think what's important if we think about that document is it really starts to drive a lot of questions more than so than answers. Uh, that said, it is a great document, but it does open up questions about, well, what type of expertise do you need and how do you create a how do you integrate your, your medical device security systems with IT security? And what happens if there actually is an incident and, and patients are impacted? Um, you know, what happens after you deploy your strategy and how do you measure and govern it? Um, so there's a lot that goes into this. And, and for uh, you know, rural and critical access hospitals, this can be overwhelming. So I'm going to try to simplify some of this. And I want to kind of give you some things to think about um, and some maybe, I don't want to say checklist, but some I guess some, some variables that you can consider as you go through and decide what you want to do next and <clears throat> how you do it. The one thing I will tell you, and probably the biggest mistake I see organizations make when it comes to medical device security is a belief that, okay, we need to go deploy software and then we're good to go. And what I would tell you is that, yes, you are going to need to deploy some type of special software to protect medical devices from cybersecurity attack, or at least detect attacks. But what I will also tell you is, if all you do is deploy software, you are probably, not probably, I can guarantee that you have not deployed a medical device security program. Software is one element of it. And here's the challenge. Most IT people um, that you turn to to help do this are going to think about this from a technical solution. Right, we do this always as IT mem team members. Right, we we see a problem, we want to apply technology to it. And it's not to say that that technology is not important, but what I think is really important here when it comes to medical devices is to understand that the software is a very small part of the overall security solution required to protect medical devices and ultimately protect patients. Ultimately, what we're trying to do with pretty much any cybersecurity strategy, but more so with medical device security strategy, is reduce liability and increase defensibility. Now, defensibility often, I think, gets misinterpreted as we're trying to defend our networks, we're trying to defend medical devices or other IT assets. But here we need to really broaden the term that we're also trying to defend ourselves uh, in the event of a, of a lawsuit, <clears throat> um, in the event that there is um, some type of class action uh, or other kind of challenge to the organization. So we need to be thinking much more broadly about defensibility than just defending the network, right? Ultimately, what we want to think about is how do we defend the patient from an attack? Uh, and if we can do that and do that consistently, then we obviously will be reducing liability ultimately. So kind of a mantra I would give you are there are three components to any security or cybersecurity strategy, but in medical device security, this becomes much, much more um, surgical, if you will. And that is you need to think about uh, any of your security strategies as a form of comply, detect, and respond. 
Now, this can be debated, but ultimately that's what we're trying to do whenever we're thinking of cybersecurity. We're trying to think about how do we comply with um, regulations and requirements. So those come under the venue of policies, procedures, and best practices. We're trying to, to detect attacks and anomalies on our networks and against uh, our, our IT and medical device assets. And then we ultimately have to figure out how do we respond to something if there actually is an attack. And what I would tell you is most organizations I speak with, most boards, IT members, clinicians, really focus on the tech side, right? They're really focused, and this goes back to let's deploy some software and we're good to go. And really they miss the comply and the respond, and then something happens and they're wondering, why are we getting sued? You know, why are we having to figure out a settlement? Why are we potentially uh, having brand damage or whatever else may happen? Why did the patient ultimately get impacted? We, we, we had this software, we thought we did the right things. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that comply and respond were not part of the equation. So first step here is, aside from starting with the patient and thinking about what, how to protect that patient, you need to also think about how are you complying with best practices? Yes, how you're detecting attacks and ultimately how you're responding. And I'm gonna give you some ideas for each one of these um, as we go through this presentation. So let's start with comply. You know, this is basically, we want to make sure we're complying with best practices. And these are specific to medical device security. Obviously we can talk about how do we comply with IT security best practices, but in this presentation, we're gonna focus on this. <clears throat> but here are the few things I will tell you. Uh, and this is not an overall comprehensive list, but it's kind of the high points. And so you could take this and create a checklist for your own strategy. Happy to share this it's with you um, if you reach out to me. Um, but let's just go through some of these and, and kind of talk through what you need to do. One of the most important things is you need medical device specific cybersecurity policies and practices. We see a lot of organizations take their IT security policies and just say, well, that will, you know, we'll just expand them and they'll cover medical device security. And you can do that to a certain point. And that point is, and one thing I need you to really think about is there is no regulation, not HIPAA, not NIST 853 or CSF, if you're familiar with that. But basically, there is no federal regulation. Um, that protects patients from cyber attack. We, all regulations that are out there, including HIPAA, only protect data and identity. So the thing to keep in mind is that all IT security policies, all IT privacy policies and practices are focused on protecting data. None of that is focused on protecting human life. So we need to really think about those areas, those policies and practices specifically related to medical device security that do help us protect patient life and patient care. So that's why we're very, we kind of champion this thought that you need to think about how you deploy specific policies and practices for medical device security. Um, a vendor assessment framework. You need to be thinking about what are you asking your medical device vendors, manufacturers around how they're developing security practices and securing that device. It's a very important component. There are specific questions you should be asking and uh, you should determine the maturity of their security program. And again, this may sound daunting, um, but it's, it's actually, once you have it in place, it's pretty simple. It's just part of the acquisition and purchase process. It doesn't take a lot to do. You just kind of have to do it. And a lot of times we don't know those things we need to do. A lot of medical devices use end of life software. They're running on systems that are no longer supported by the operating system manufacturer or the original equipment manufacturer. And so it's important to get inventory of what devices in your environment are end of life. This doesn't mean you have to go get rid of them, but you should identify them. And then you should determine how do you protect those or segregate those. Uh, let's be honest, you can't just go out and buy a new CAT scan or new MRI. Um, those things have 20, 30 year uh, capitalization tables. And so you need to think about this in a very long-term way, but you also need to identify them and do what you can to protect them from attack. Um, so it's just important to have that end of life management program. You do need a cross-functional medical device cybersecurity team. And one of the things we often see that's a mistake is medical device security is relegated to either clinical engineering or biomed and IT and or IT. That is certainly two of the components but you need to bring into play nursing, physicians, uh, compliance, legal, um, your nursing education team. And we'll talk more about why these things are important as we go through some of the next slides. But just keep in mind, you need a cross-functional team 
Uh, remember, we talked about boardroom to basement alignment when it comes to medical device security, and this is kind of where that rubber meets the road, and you really need to have cross-functional representation. Um, I'm not going to get into governance and management and threat intel. They are important aspects of this, but in the interest of time, I want to kind of go on to the next piece. So what about detection? Now, this is going to get a little geeky. I'm not going to get too deep into it. I'm going to run through it, and you can always speak to either us or your IT team about where you're at in this. In terms of medical device security, you need to employ something known as deep packet inspection. You need to really, really understand what's happening on your network at a very low level. You should employ deception technologies. Simply stated, these are things known as honeypots. They basically pretend to be a device on your network, even though they're not a real device. And if somebody touches them, they set off an alert. I'll explain more about why you need those honeypots or uh, deception technologies in a moment. Host intrusion detection, this is the ability to determine if somebody's attempting to attack servers or computers that um, are connected to or support your medical devices. So this is important. Asset fingerprinting, simply stated, it just means the ability for you to discover what devices are on your network and what's talking to what, uh, specifically to medical devices. You do want to have some kind of vulnerability monitoring in place, but most important of all this is you need somebody who has 24 by 7 monitoring. And let's go back to this concept of increasing defensibility and reducing liability. If you put in place a program, especially let's go back to the idea of, oh, we deployed some software that should be good enough, um, and you're not monitoring it, and there's an attack at three in the morning, right? Most hospitals don't shut down, and you don't know about that attack until 9 a.m., 10 a.m. when people come in. You have a big issue in defending yourself in a, in a deposition or a courtroom, and so you need to have some form of 24 by 7 monitoring. And by 24 by 7, you really want to have some kind of eyes on glass, where if there's an attack, especially against the medical device, within minutes, there's going to be some form of a response. And so this is really important to understand. Um, you can't just deploy a bunch of policies, practices, a team, and, and software, and then you're not actually watching to see if something happens, right? So you kind of almost want to deploy an ICU, if you will, for your, your IT security, medical device security program, which is technically what we would call a security operations center or a SOC. Lastly is respond. So this gets a little bit, um, we're going to talk a little more about this, but I want to be clear that medical device security response is different than IT security response. You know, if somebody attacks a server, uh, your EMR, your, your, um, <clears throat> your, your RCM, your recycle management system, your scheduling system, the response to that is going to be vastly different than the response to, for example, a um, CAT scan, a cath lab an MRI machine, a ventilator that's attached, a network attached, those types of responses are going to be vastly different. And you need to at least recognize that, you know, the response is different, the people involved are different, their training is different, and you need to test that response. You need to have some form of uh, tabletop simulation, maybe on an annual basis. The point of this is that you can't, again, just take what you do with IT and layer it onto medical device and think you're good to go. These are very different worlds. As I mentioned earlier, IT is focused on protecting data. Uh, when I speak to IT organizations about this, they start to get very concerned about, hey, guess what? You now are going to be responsible for patient care. You need to detect these things. You need to respond to them. And that's a very tall ask for a profession that has had no background in caring for patients. Uh, so it's important, again, this kind of goes back to why we need that cross-functional team that I mentioned earlier. We're going to talk a little more about this in the next couple of slides. So one thing I want to bring up to you is third-party medical device networks and something to keep in mind here. <clears throat> um, you may have Philips networks, Siemens, GE networks in your environment that are managed, operated uh, by those third parties. Uh, and they are considered closed networks. Now, you still have a security responsibility, but you can't just deploy things on them. In fact, if you deploy uh, things onto those networks to monitor them, you could void the warranty and, and create patient safety issues. So again, this is a very complicated area, and if you don't have the right guidance, you can find yourself downstream uh, in a situation where you didn't even realize you were voiding warranties and creating patient safety issues. So what do you do to monitor these kind of networks that are really operated by third parties? The best thing to do is what we mentioned earlier, deception technologies, honeypots. They can be deployed because they don't tamper with, interrupt, or in any way impact um, network traffic. Uh, 
So <clears throat> that's kind of um, your, your answer there, right? But it's important, the more important thing here is to really understand that depending on what software and, and technology you're deploying to protect your medical device security program or to support your medical device security program, um, you could impact patient safety or warranties. And so again, there's much more here to, to this specialty, to this area than just protecting data. I kind of mentioned a little bit about incident response in, one of, in a couple, uh, couple slides ago, and I wanna talk a little more about that. The important thing to understand here is that your typical incident response plan is usually very hierarchical, meaning that IT incident response, you, talk, you call someone, that person calls another person, they call someone else, and eventually someone makes a decision as to what to do. And, and you, could, you could test this in your own organization, you may already be aware of it, but most, if not all, incident response plans that are playbook driven are very kind of focused on this hierarchical nature. And they really don't work very well, even in protecting data in this day and age. But when you take those types of incident response models and you apply them to medical device security, it's a really, really bad move. If you think about it this way, <clears throat> you suddenly are told that there's a, an attack against a medical device that's connected to a patient. And in that situation, you have minutes to evaluate and respond to what is happening. You don't have time for hierarchy. So one of the things actually that we've done is um, we've actually built protocols and we use that word very purposely because protocols are very familiar to clinicians. And when you think about who's gonna be responding to a medical device security event, it's typically not going to be the IT organization, it's gonna be your clinical rapid response team. They are set up to support and deal with rapidly deteriorating patients and in a situation where a medical device has been attacked, they should be the front line of supporting uh, a response, right? Because they can support that patient. And again, this gets back to how do we reduce liability and increase defensibility? The challenges here though, and the things that kind of you have to start thinking about is what if those attacks occur across multiple devices? You probably only have one clinical rapid response team. So how does that team scale to support multiple devices or multiple device attack? We have this thing called the Star Trek challenge where do you shut down the devices but impact patient safety? Or if you don't shut down the devices, the attack spreads and you impact more patients, you know, where is that equilibrium? These are all kinds of the scenarios that for the most part are way outside the current wheelhouse of IT security or IT professionals. And that's not you know, a put down on anybody. I come from an IT background, but it's just kind of calling out reality. And these are the things that make medical device security a little bit challenging. And it's not just, hey, if I deploy some software, I'm good. You can deploy that software, but if you don't have all the other things we talked about, especially incident response covered, you may end up in a situation downstream that is, is a very uncomfortable place to be when you're, you're being deposed or, or you're on a witness stand somewhere. So think about medical, how you're going to respond to these incidents and, and what really needs to be evolved and matured in order to do it effectively. Resource challenges, again, are part of the problem that we see in this space. And part of that is, you know, obviously there's priority of projects and a lot of things going on. I doubt there's any hospital that can say we've got a ton of time and we're just waiting for our next project to kick off. Uh, but the other side of this is the expertise, right? Um, is that there aren't very many people in the industry that understand medical device security uh, at, at a very practical level and a uh, level that could be considered uh, holistic and comprehensive. It's still a very emerging space. Um, a lot of organizations are trying to figure it out on their own, uh, and that is a very valid approach, um, but there's a limited amount of resources. And so this is a challenge in terms of how do you stand up your medical device security program and something to think about as you start to explore how you want to address this, this challenge. It's not something that obviously will go away, um, but it is something that, you know, <clears throat> with time you're going to need to address and uh you know it's probably going to be a major project for most organizations um, there's no real other way to say it i can't really make it easier for anyone other than to kind of hopefully just call it out what it is and and, and hope that some of the advice we've been sharing with you helps us simplify it to some level so what are your strategic options um you can go your own there are a variety of vendors um, that provide programs, um, well, I should say a variety of vendors that provide uh, software solutions in this space. 
Um, we, we are one of them. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, if you decide, hey, we just want to do this on our own, we're good, we, we, we can do this and handle it. Um, one thing I will offer you is we have written a medical device cybersecurity field manual. Um, there's a couple email addresses there on the screen. Feel free to reach out to us. There's no obligation. We will send you the manual. It takes everything we just talked about in this presentation and gives you kind of all the background. There's a, a skeleton project outlined. If you want to do it yourself, you can kind of use the project skeleton to start laying out your project plan and how you do this and what you need to do. <clears throat> Uh, I think it's also a good way for you to develop, uh, you know, an assessment or an evaluation of either where you stand today or possibly of vendors that you're thinking of working with and, and determining how they're going to uh, uh, support you. Um, I can tell you that we have, uh, how do I say this being without being politically incorrect, I guess, right now we are kind of the only vendor that does all the stuff that you just we just talked to you about. And that's why we know it so well. Um, so you can um, hire consultants and software companies and monitoring companies and all those different pieces and bring them all together um, and hope and you'll end up hopefully with a good program. Uh, what we did <clears throat> is we've actually built uh, everything you need to meet or exceed the FDA requirements and to address everything that we just spoke about in all of these slides. Um, so we have what we call a full stack solution, which includes 24 by seven monitoring by a security operations center, we call the CTOC. We provide all the software, we provide the honey pots, we provide a maturity model. We have the templates, uh, actual templates in Word and Excel that you can um, customize for your medical device security policies and practices and procedures. We have a vendor assessment framework. Um, and probably the best news on this, if, if there is that, um, is that we've priced this to be cognizant of the challenges faced by critical access and, and uh, rural hospitals. So we've really tried to focus really hard on how do we provide all this at a price point um, that we believe is friendly um, to this specific space. Uh, in fact, we, we try to work very closely with critical access and rural hospitals. We've done this in such a way that everything can be done remotely. We don't need to bring people on site, so you don't have to worry about T and E. Um, and you know, we can we pretty much have all the pieces of the puzzle. But again, if you want to do it on your own, you certainly can. Um, and and if you have questions about that and you decide, hey, we do want to either figure out more about what you guys are doing and could we use what you're doing, or we want to do this on our own, but we're not too sure about this or that. You know, at the end of the day, we believe not everything has to be a contract or a statement of work. Um, ultimately, there are patients that need to be protected. And so if you have a question, a concern, whatever it may be, we'd love to talk to you. Um, my email address is up there. You can certainly reach out. We're happy to give you the slides, the field manual. And you know, if there is an opportunity to work with you, um, we would really appreciate that. But most of all, I think it's just very important. You know, One thing about healthcare that we all know is at some point, each and every human in the United States, regardless of color, political affiliation, whatever it may be, will rely at some point in their life on the healthcare industry. And I think so there's a, there's a need to, at this point in time, think about how do we protect everybody so that the people in your hospitals, the clinicians and those that are providing care can, can do what they do best without having to worry about, is there gonna be a cyber attack against the medical device or against my patient directly? So with that, I do truly appreciate um, you taking time today. Um, and again, if there's anything we can do, please reach out. Um, but I hope you found a little bit of value in this presentation and, and some food for thought and hopefully some, some good next steps. Thank you so much.